The Fed is faced with a third nuclear option, and it's bad. Now, the Federal Reserve and other central banks globally are fighting the deleveraging of the largest debt bubble in modern history. To counter this deleveraging, they've been propping up markets, lowering interest rates, and other financial engineering. And this has led to the fastest rise in inflation we've seen in over three decades. Now, with inflation hitting these levels, many are calling for a more responsible policy. They're calling for better decisions from central banks to tame the inflation that's now affecting each and every one of us. But the Fed's stuck. If they continue to stimulate and prop up the markets, the assets and the price inflation is going to continue to skyrocket. If they stop stimulating and tapering and raising rates, then the markets are going to crash. So many are left thinking that the Federal Reserve and the central banks, they're stuck. But that might not be the case. There's a signaling from the Fed and from the central bankers that they may take an old play from history and present us with a third scarier option, a nuclear option that is both bad, <laughs> it's scary, and um, from recent talks and headlines, it looks like this is what they may be preparing to do. So in this video, I'm gonna break down the proverbial rock in the hard place that they find themselves in, why either direction they choose ends up bad for us. I'm gonna explain this third scarier nuclear option. I wanna show you what happens through history when this option has been deployed and tried and of course, what you should be watching for, and more importantly, what you should be doing to protect yourself from these coming changes. So let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss, and I make these videos to change the way you think about money because almost everything that you've learned is wrong. All the headlines are misleading, and so you need to learn how to think things through. Now, I'm going to talk about um, a, a debate that's probably the biggest debate in macroeconomics. Are we going to have inflation? Or are we going to have deflation? What can the Fed do about this? They're stuck between this proverbial rock and a hard place. Well, uh, like I said, I'm going to present to you a third scarier option, one that you probably haven't heard yet, but it's one that has been tried before. So let's talk, let's talk about this. So of course, um, you probably know by now, I'm not going to give you the full backstory, but the central banks, they're fighting the largest debt bubble we've ever seen. We have massive amounts of debt. We got off the gold standard 50 years ago, um, the, Nixon the Nixon shock, and since then we've been printing, creating an unlimited amount of debt. Um, inflation, because of that, because of this monetary expansion, we've seen inflation hit a 30-year high. Here's a chart for that. Now, I like to go off of the saying like Friedman that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. So when you expand the monetary base, you're going to get inflation. It hits different ways, different places, but you can see that we are at an all-time high in inflation. Now, what we've seen is throughout the last several decades, any attempt, and specifically really the last decade, any attempt that the Fed has to try to um, taper or stop stimulating or stop pumping the markets up, any attempt that they've had at doing that, um, the markets start to crash. So if they continue printing, inflation continues higher. If they stop printing, the markets crash. So are they out of options? Are they stuck in this proverbial rock in a hard place? Well, let's dig into that just a little bit. So of course, as I said, we have this global debt crisis. It's like this, this debt bomb, as you can see it right there. I've used that image before. And so we're at this situation where deleveraging we have, we've stimulated, we've increased the monetary supply, and now at this point, delevering debt, it's not really an option, all right? The world's never had more debt, and as much as they want to deleverage, as much as the markets want to deleverage, they can't allow that to happen. That would be deflation. That'd mean the price of your home going down, that'd be the price of your stocks going down, the price of all your assets going down, all the collateral for all the debt going down. It would be a massive problem. So of course they can't allow that to happen. It would end up going into like a mass deleveraging um, event like we had back in the 1930s, which you can see right here, which led to a massive crash. Because as this debt goes up, it's, it's leverage. And so when the debt goes down, it's leverage just the same way. And we'd see about the same results. You can see a graphical uh, picture of what this global debt looks like. Every nation in the world is pretty much in the red with record amounts of debt. Now, we've seen this similar event, like I said, in the 1930s, of course, that was known as the Great Depression. We had a 90% correction in the Dow. And for the next decade, we saw basically unemployment at all-time highs, 
people starving, uh, just no growth at all. Like I said, it was known as the Great Depression. So that's what they want to avoid from happening again. But how? If they continue stimulating, the inflation keeps going higher. Well, we can see that there's only one way out of this. So they're stuck choosing between one or the other, but at the end of the day, there's really only one way out of this. Um, per this report by Hirschman Capital, um, it shows that, uh, I have the report right here, or a piece of the report, it basically shows that anytime a nation gets over 130% debt, there's no way out. It says right here, since the 1800s, 51 out of 52 countries, 51 out of 52 countries, with a gross government debt greater than 130% have defaulted. 51 of 52 have defaulted when they've been over 130%, either through restructuring, restructuring the debt, devaluation, sound familiar, a high inflation or an outright default, just saying we're not gonna pay it, all right? The Fed has been executing a highly leveraged carry trade by borrowing to purchase higher yielding government agency corporate bonds. So this is a little bit of a, a misconception that people have. Of course, I use the word printing all the time. When I say printing, I'm just generally talking about a monetary expansion, but here they're not printing, they're actually borrowing government debt in order to buy those government bonds. So it says here, contrary to popular belief, the Fed cannot pay off the debt by printing money. They can't pay the debt off that way. If they did, it would cause hyperinflation. It's used the money funded by uh, bond purchases by borrowing rather than printing. So it's, that's why we have debt. That's why we have almost $30 trillion of debt because they've been borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. The catch is the Fed will be trapped. If treasury yields spike due to the debt crisis, then the Fed does not, uh, then the Fed can't raise rates because of all the amount of debt that they have. The Fed deposits lend them to the economy. If the Fed does raise the interest rate on its deposits, the carry will be too much for the amount of debt they have. So that's the problem that they have. Uh, it was outlined in this book. So 51 out of 52 nations have defaulted once they've been over 130%, which is where we're at today. And so really the default is gonna happen either through a devaluation of the currency, which devalues the debt, through inflation, what we have, or restructuring the debt. Um, and that's basically what we saw back in 1971 in the Nixon shock. All the nations of the world were pegging their currency to the dollar. The dollar is supposed to be pegged to gold. And so the other nations said, hey, US, we see what you're doing. You're printing all this fake currency. We don't want the currency anymore. We'll take the gold. We want you to pay your debts that you owe us. And in 1971, Nixon said, nope, no more. We're not paying anymore. So that was a default. That was the, the United States government defaulted on their debt at that time. Now, the US has crossed the Rubicon. As I said, 51 of 52 countries that have gone past 130% debt to GDP have never recovered from that, and we are past that point. The last time we saw this amount of debt was in the 1940s, um, which of course was the end of the long-term debt cycle, which was the, uh, around the um, Great Depression. And of course, if you've been watching my videos uh, consistently, then you know I talk about this 80-year financial revolution cycle that's also matched up with a 50-year revolution cycle that's also matched up with a 250-year political revolution cycle that all three are converging right now. Editor, go ahead and hit the playlist and put that playlist up here so they can watch those three videos if they want. But if we look at the long-term debt cycle, we can see that we basically have this productivity growth and then we have this debt cycle that comes down and it works on about a 75, 80 year time frame, which is exactly where we are right now. When you understand these cycles, it helps you to understand what's going on. You know what else helps you understand what's going on? Going back into the future. It's about that time. Let's go ahead and dig a little bit further back in history so you can see what this third scarier option is that I'm talking about and potentially what comes next. All right, so we're gonna go back to the 1930s. Again, we go back to about 80 years, which was the last financial revolution. So this is the 1930s blueprint of what happened back then and probably what is going to be happening right now, again, on the revolution cycle. So back then, the central banks, they basically pegged rates down to 2.5% for about a decade. This is known as yield curve control. I'm sure you've been hearing that word thrown around, um, but basically they're, they're holding that yield, the yield curve, which is the amount of debt or interest that's paid on the debt. And they did that so they could run large fiscal deficits so they could tackle the debt from World War I. So there was a massive amount of debt. They, um, the debt to GDP was too high and they needed a way to handle that. 
when they did that, it caused massive inflation through the 40s. Now we can see an uh, image or a picture of this, a chart of this, just so I can show you what I mean. Here's a century of US monetary policy. So right here in the 30s and 40s is this period that we're talking about right here. So you can see that they pinned rates down right here. They cranked up the, the fiscal stimulus, which is the money the government puts out, and you can see what happened right here. It spiked up higher. Then we are starting to see that again right now, but we're gonna come back to that in just a moment. We can also see at that same time, as they devalued the currency um, and they decreased their nominal debt, it also increased the, um, the interest rate. So we can see here that debt to GDP got up to 120% right here in about 1945. The debt to GDP came down for a while and you can see how it's starting to shoot back up higher. Of course, now it's all the way back up there again. Now, a good question is, will history repeat or is history just gonna rhyme? Well, <laughs> either way, it's gonna sound about the same. So let's take a look at that. And now um, I talked about this IMF paper, a 2015 paper from the IMF which talks about the liquidation of government debt. As a matter of fact, I did this video, of editor, go ahead and put a link up to it up above, called The Government Trap. And I talked about this paper specifically and how they outlined in 2015, how they could use something called financial repression, which is basically a way to get out of the debt that they owe and steal the money from you and I. They outlined it in this paper. Go watch that video that goes into great length as to what that is. So I'm not gonna go into it again right now, but the one thing that I would say is that I always like to listen what they say. A lot of people tell me, Mark, you're a conspiracy theorist. And I said, well, I'm just reading their books. I'm reading their papers and I take them at their word. And so you should understand what those things say. So go back and watch that video. Um, but basically we have this um, taper or tantrum. Can they taper the markets without the markets crashing? We can see that, that, as I said, inflation is pressuring the Fed to start reducing the amount of stimulus they have to taper. Inflation's causing that. Prices are shooting high. Uh, people are starting to complain. Uh, we're starting to see, well, I'll get more into that in a minute. And so um, Jerome Powell from the Federal Reserve announced that they would start to taper at about uh, about $15 billion per month. So they're tapering, they're, right now they're stimulating about $120 billion a month. They'll taper that out $15 billion, so bring it down to about $105 billion. I mean, it's it's a smidgen. It's, a, it's, not, it's not much. But the last time they tried this was in 2019. I have a chart I'll show you here. We can see that tapering, talking, tightening, the Federal Reserve's masterful messaging. So right now they're signaling to the market that they want to do this. They're talking about it. They're saying they're gonna do it. And just them talking about it has been enough to cause this instability that we've seen in the market over the last week or so. But I wanna go, go back to this chart right here because the last time they actually did it, the last time we saw any tapering, it caused the market to dump off in about three weeks, which was a pretty massive plunge, which was like, oh shoot, <laughs> we didn't realize um, I guess there's no tapering. And so that's the last time that it happened and I would imagine that it's going to happen the same time again. The government needs stimulus. Once the patient's on life support, the patient continues to need life support. It's like a drug addict. You can't just stop taking drugs cold turkey and they are not able to pull that back. And the problem is, is that the more leverage that we get into the system, the more volatile it gets. So we can see here that each time the, the uh, markets have to be bailed out, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger each time because the amount of leverage has to increase. So the more they pump it up, the more it deflates, the more it takes to pump it back up. Uh, the example that I've used many times is that in 2008, when they had to bail out the entire financial system, it was 700 billion. And today it's trillions. You can get an idea of how that has changed. And this shows the, the volatility that we have. So in 1929, it took about 35 days for the market to drop off. In 1987, it was about 38 days for the market to sell off. But in 2020, in March of 2020, it took only 16 days. So in half the time, the market dropped about the same amount. That's because the amount of leverage that is there. All right, so now that you understand the proverbial rock in the hard place, what comes next? 
what is this third scarier option, this third nuclear option that I've been talking about? Well, let's take a look at that. So um, inflation is, is a hot topic, obviously, um, not just at Thanksgiving over the kitchen table, as I'm sure many were talking about the price of turkey going up, but the Federal Reserve was running um, campaigns about turkey. They were saying that maybe you should have tofurkey instead. They were showing how soy could have as much protein as turkey, so they're starting to show us that. Of course, over the news, they were showing us how much turkey had increased um, from $28 in 2020 to $55 the very next year, almost a 100% increase in the price of turkey. So it was over the news. Uh, you had to pay for it at the grocery store. I'm sure you were talking about it as well, um, as well as gas prices, which have gone up like crazy. And of course, it's no, uh, it's no mystery why inflation is being talked about so much, because as you can see, it is the biggest topic. It is happening all over. Uh, everybody is seeing those prices happening. Now, it's gotten to a point though, and this is where the third scary option comes in, that we're starting to see the politicians starting to talk about this, but not in a way, uh, not in a good way, in a bad way. So what we've seen is Senator, Senator Elizabeth Warren is calling these corporations greedy. As a matter of fact, she calls for a probe into the turkey companies to find out why they're charging you so much. Warren accuses poultry industry of excessive consolidation and price fixing. So she's saying, hey, the price of turkey doubled. Are you gouging us? Do we need to look into that? That's what she's saying. Like I said, it's all over the news. We've seen that. And we've even seen, and this is where it starts getting even scarier, now the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, orders Walmart, Amazon, and Kroger, and more to turn over information on the empty shelves and the higher prices. We want to see your books. We want to see the data. Why are there empty shelves? Why are the prices going so much higher? Well, <laughs> I don't think they need to look at their books. I think what they need to do is look at why the Fed is printing so much money, why that money is being used to slow down supply chains and get people not to work, and why that is causing the prices to go up. But instead, no, 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 no. Let's look at why they're greedy, why they're gouging us, but this is where it's going. What they're basically saying, what they're hinting to is price controls. This is the third scary option. I'm gonna explain that to you, but think about it. If they can't keep prices from going up because they have to keep stimulating, they can't stop stimulating because the markets will crash. So if they keep stimulating and prices go up, what if they can just fix the prices so people can't raise the prices anymore? That's what they're starting to signal. That's what they're starting to say right now. In addition, they're even starting to say some more scarier things like this. Grocery shopping future will bring severe food rationing. Poverty is good. Deprivation is plenty and empty shelves are a reset to the way things should be. How dare you? Why would you think that the shelves should always be full? Why should you always be able to go to the store and get what you want? I mean, this is America. Shouldn't we be deprived? Shouldn't we be okay with having empty shelves? That's what they're starting to say. That's how scary this is getting. But let me show you a little bit of history, back to history, on the history of price fixing. All right, now we've seen uh, this fail uh, every time it's been tried. I can go through hundreds or probably thousands of examples, but I'm not gonna spend that long with you. We saw a 10% inflation, which we're at about 6% now, so we're getting close to that number. About 10% inflation in 1941, uh, that was before World War II. We saw the OPA, they were formed to control prices of that time because inflation was getting too high. Um, when they did that, they started to ration both food and gasoline. We can see, I pulled up a chart right here. This shows you from before World War um, II. And this was the food ration for one adult. They got two to three pints of milk, two ounces of tea, one egg, two ounces of cheese, and on and on and on. This is what they would give you as a ration. In addition, they, they were rationing gas. Now what happens whenever they do price fixing or they ration supplies? It's been done through um, Stalin's Russia. It was done through Hitler's Germany. It's been tried in the United States. Of course, it's happened in Mao's China and people die every time. And the reason why is because when you fix prices, it leads to shortages. It leads to food shortages every single time. It always will. Why? Because as humans, we're driven by our own self-interest. 
I want to make a profit. I start a business to make a profit. And if you fix my prices and I'm not able to make a profit, then guess what? I'm not going to make that food or that good any longer. Why would I? Why? How, how could I? How could I continue to stay in business making food if I'm losing money? I can't do that. And so people stop. And guess what? Then it leads to shortages every single time because there is no incentives. Now, after a while, inflation slowed down um, into the um, throughout the 50s because the Fed started tightening and raising rates. So remember I told you I'd show you this chart again. So you can see here when the fiscal started tightening and the rates started going back up at the same time, then things started to mellow out again. It wasn't because of the price fixing, it was because they did the hard thing. They pulled back on the monetary stimulus and they increased rates at the same, same time. Unfortunately, the leaders don't seem to learn from history. So we're faced with the same two problems again. We're increasing the monetary, we're lowering rates, but are we going to make the same mistakes of trying price fixing first or will we do the hard necessary things to get this right now it seems like we're going to face the third scarier option which we know is going to lead to failure we know this because a lot of this pain is self-inflicted if they knew what to do if they were able or willing to make the hard decisions they'd be doing it but of course they're not maybe they're not even aware. I find that hard to believe, but maybe they're not even aware. So we see that they want to investigate companies. Senator, Senator Elizabeth Warren wants to investigate the turkey companies. Biden calls on the Federal Trade Commission to probe anti-consumer behavior by energy companies as gas prices are soaring. So gas prices are going up so high. Now the president, President Brandon, wants to now call the FTC to find out why the gas companies are gouging you, which is, which is uh, I'm sure everybody has seen the price of those going up. Here's the gas prices. Of course, if you're filling up your own gas tank, you've noticed that prices have pretty much doubled since Biden has been in office. But what's interesting is that because, you know, he wants to, he wants to form a committee to find out the FTC to dig into why they're gouging consumers. But we see here the American Petroleum Institute um, said in a letter that a quote, distraction from the fundamental market shift. It's a distraction. That ongoing economic emerge from the pandemic. The industry said in a statement that it's ill-advised government decisions are exacerbating this challenging situation. So it's the government policies that are causing this. If they were just left on their own, they could probably fix the situation. Now, what kind of policies? Well, how about closing down the oil pipelines? We need the oil to make gasoline. You shut down the oil, what do you think is gonna happen to the gasoline? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. And so as energy prices are going up throughout the world and President Brandon wants to open up an FTC um, committee to find out why gasoline companies are gouging us, he could just look at his own policies, how he shut down all the oil pipelines. And we can see that as oil production ramped up, here and now oil production has fallen off of a cliff. So when you drop oil production by 10 to 20%, what do you think is gonna happen? It's the law of supply and demand. If we still have demand for oil because we still want to drive our food to get delivered at the restaurant, we still want to travel, I still need to drive to work, we still need the oil, but you cut the supply down, what do you think is gonna happen? An elementary kid could tell you the answer to that, all right? but. Again, going back to price fixing, it never works. It never works. Now in 1970s, they had the Economic Stabilization Act, which was basically to put a 90 day freeze on all wages, um, on all prices. They started doing price controls on gasoline, which led to uh, people lining up on different days of the week to get gasoline. They did it price controls on food like chicken, which then led to massive problems with chickens. They couldn't get them to market. People couldn't get them. Um, and then they had to restructure the CPI basket, the consumer price index. They removed 75% of the basket of goods so they could pretend like the CPI was staying down. Now, there's two other videos that I recently did that are going to only show you how much worse this is going to get. I'm not gonna go in deep into these, but one, I would recommend watching this video, um, editor, go ahead and put it up here on the screen, where I talk about how there's a massive change coming to banking that is going to make this even way scarier and way worse. Uh, Biden has a new pick for the OCC. I don't wanna go deep into that, but if you understand this, it's gonna help you understand this whole price fixing thing and why it's coming. The other video is that you could watch this video uh, um, where I talk about Mises and how he predicted that this was going to happen. 
um, the crack up boom. And if you understand what the crack up boom is, then you're also gonna understand where this is going. I'm not gonna go deep into those two videos, but editor, go ahead and link both of them up above right here. <sighs> I know it's a lot, it's a lot. It's a third scary option. If they print, inflation. If they don't print, the markets crash. So let's keep printing and then we'll fix the prices so we don't have the inflation. I hope that doesn't happen, but all roads lead to me thinking that it will, including Biden's pick for the OCC. So in light of that, how do we protect ourselves from this? All right, well, there's a couple things. We have to understand that central planning always fails. They need to let the markets be free. As you can see, I want you to watch this, the more they try to centrally control things, the worse things get. All right, so it's always gonna fail. What you need to do is you have to focus on your purchasing power. Forget thinking about things in terms of dollars. Instead, think about um, things in terms of purchasing power because the dollar is being so manipulated. If you look at just your price of your home in dollars terms, you're completely missing. If you're looking at only your stocks in dollars terms, you're completely missing the picture. So you need to start thinking about things in terms of purchasing power. Also, you need to get your wealth to grow faster than inflation. So if inflation is about 15% a year, your wealth needs to be growing by more than 15% per year or you're losing your wealth. You also need to have hard assets that are outside of the banking system, outside of their control. Of course, those are at harder assets being assets that they can't inflate. They can't make more gold, they can't make more Bitcoin, they can't make more land, etc. Of course, Bitcoin achieves both of these things. It has been going up at an average compounded annual growth rate of 200% per year, and it's completely outside of their control. They can't manipulate, they can't make more of it, they can't seize it, they can't steal it, they can't censor it. Um, and so those are the ways that we'll protect ourselves as this goes through. Stop thinking about things in terms of dollars. There's another, another video I did about how, uh, when money dies, editor, go ahead and link that up. If you really wanna know what happens as this process goes through, uh, go watch that video. And I know it's scary, but this is what we're facing. So you need to be prepared for it. I like to say that an ostrich can bury its head in the sand, but it doesn't stop it from being eaten. So don't ignore it. Do something about it, plan for it. Leave me a comment and let me know what you're doing to prepare and to plan for this. Of course, as always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. And if you don't like the video, give me a thumbs down. That's okay, even though YouTube took away my dislike button <laughs> for whatever reason. But go ahead and give me a thumbs down, but give me a comment and let me know why. Shoot me a comment on Twitter, at one Mark Moss. I'd love to hear from you on Twitter, at one Mark Moss. And that's what I got for you today. All right, to your success. I'm out.